Half a century after his death, a whiff of sulphur and brimstone still clings to the name of Alistair Crowley. In the 20s, the Beaverbrook newspapers christened him the wickedest man in the world. By the 60s, he was a flower power hero, credited with the philosophy of doing one's own thing and appearing in the Beatles' pantheon of people we like on the cover of Sgt. Pepper between Mae West and an Oriental guru. I do not wish to paint Crowley as either saint or Satanist, but I do think he qualifies as one of this century's good ideas, as an innovator, a religious synthesizer who required that we think for ourselves. Satanism is the worship of Satan, or Shaitan, the Hebrew word for adversary. This muddled accusation, levied on the shade of the notorious drug fiend, occultist and author, has not gone away yet. The Beast's insouciance and sexual panache was starred on Lord Byron, though the later poet had to invent any titles he wanted. And invent he did. A whole pseudo-aristocratic wardrobe, Baron's far off, the Laird of Beleskin, the Comte de Belstray, the Ipsissimus, the Magical Grade, the very thing itself. The Beast died in a boarding house in Hastings in 1947. The Hymn to Pan, a fine poem by Crowley, was read at his funeral. Born in 1875, Crowley was brought up amidst religious dread and Victorian morals, which he reacted against with all the force of his considerable personality. Queen Victoria, A.C. wrote, was sheer suffocation, a vast thick fog that enveloped us all. We could not breathe, we could not see, the spirit of her age had killed everything we cared for. And it was against that spirit that the shaven-headed Enfant Terrible of Leamington took his strongest and most modern actions. When young, Crowley belonged briefly to the Magical Society, the Order of the Golden Dawn, along with W.B. Yeats. But unable to brook chastity or competition for long, the bully boy of British magic appeared in the inner sanctum dressed in a kilt, playing the bagpipes. Crowley was duly expelled from the order, pinched a number of rituals, and started his own. Crowley, a bisexual, liked sex and drugs, lots of drugs. Ether, alcohol, and hanolium luini, opium and its derivatives, cocaine and heroin. The speed with which Crowley's successive wives and consorts fell into degeneracy and alcohol was remarkable, as the beast, codenamed Frata Perdurabo, I will endure, trudged on in his self-appointed mission to save the world. Certainly Crowley preyed on the weak. To trample his loved ones into the primordial slime became a sort of Nietzschean imperative for Crowley. Indulgence in coke and heroin played their part as ever in this kind of destructive, egotistical behavior. Opiates were freely available over the counter for the first 50 years of the beast's life. Aspiring junkies take note of the connection between loss of libido and drug abuse in his intensely self-scrutinizing diaries, chastening thought, hardly diabolic. The beast, like messiahs everywhere, went all the way and blurred the line between self and others. But we don't have to go all the way with AC to recognize the value of the areas he explored in the unconscious. If Crowley was not a Satanist, and not a saint, then what was he? There is his unusual claim to have founded a religion, something very un-English. Gerald York was a sometime disciple, and told me he thought Crowley, whom he called Old Crow, was a failed magus. Gerald had a talisman made from dried semen and menstrual blood on paper, created along Crowleyan lines, and he had consecrated this talisman with the aim of magically drawing together all of Crowley's manuscripts, the operation, he said, had been successful. In the early days, Crowley had a private income. In later years, when he lived off his disciples, he does not appear to have abated his roaring persona, testing the limits of social behavior by biting unlucky women on the back of the hand to draw blood, Mr. Crowley's unforgettable serpent kiss, sometimes by cooking inedibly hot curries, or oh, then Mr. Crowley has done it again, or slyly defecating on the rugs of his hostesses to tell them, what exactly are you trying to say, 666? But when up against the nuclear merchants and other genocide enthusiasts of the 20th century, gross social behavior seems a quibble. And does not the master Gurdjieff say, always astonish? Gurdjieff, 
who bought and sold carpets to keep his harem going, couldn't stand AC, and on their one meeting, the Turkish sage told him, Get out, you dirty inside. As a rule, Magnuses do not get on. Perhaps Gurdjieff had heard about Alistair's trick with the rugs. Crowley, on his drive to save the world, had taken up an oriental tantric process, concentrating the will during the moment of orgasm. In Tantra, it is called the left-hand way. Crowley called it sex magic. The wish, according to devotees, will get you what you need, not everything you ask for. There is a school of thought that suggests he was the first sex instructor of the 20th century. If he occupies this position, it is by default, as sex explorer is closer to the mark, supping on the juices of himself and his companion of choice for their rejuvenative powers. He was in his 70s, played with asthma when he died, so it is not clear whether Dr. Crowley's special formula worked or not. W.B. Yeats and the Duke of Windsor went in for the rejuvenating effect of monkey glands. Takes all sorts.